Here you are. All right, perfect. Well, we are recording and we are with Peter Todd. Peter, how are you, my friend? I'm good, thanks. Cool, cool. Nice to reconnect. It's been a while. Oh, uh, geez, when was the last time we even met? It was like probably a couple years ago, no, at one of some of the events. I think but... in Toronto, actually. In, in Toronto? Uh, or where it was? At one of the Sh Sheraton events, perhaps, or maybe some. Yeah. Uh, at one point, it yeah. felt like there was an event every day, no? <laughs> <laughs> I got evented out, but now, I'm yeah. not gonna lie, I kind of miss. Uh, Miss humans a little bit. <laughs> get, get yeah, they were, uh, there's something to be said for that. Right, right. I, I mean, mean for, all, for all you know, every single like Zoom meeting you have is actually an AI on the other end. How do you know humanity still exists? Well, I mean, this one definitely is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it's funny. The, the, the last tangential question, not one of the important questions, but that I ask everybody is what are your thoughts on AI? <laughs> so we just kind of started from the end and we're going to wait yeah. very backwards. But do you, do you think about AI much? That's an interesting question. Because I, Cause I, know I guess AI the answer to that you. is yes and no. Okay, well, see, okay. the answer to that is yes and no. Okay, okay. Because as much as I think about AI and the term many people use it, I'm still kind of disappointed at where we are. Like all, yeah. all, all our AI stuff is the total opposite of what we expected. Hmm. You know, yeah. it's all about pattern matching and it's actually kind of dumb in some ways, even mm. though seemingly performs miracles. You know, it's the total opposite of like the Star Trek data AI, where it has all this logical reasoning power, but no like pattern recognition, if you will, you know, no human touch. In reality, AI is the exact opposite. All this sort of pseudo fake human touch and no logic. Interesting. Interesting. Would you say that, 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 that you're talking about the difference between like narrow bands of AI and like maybe general AI and as, as they call it. And, and, and my question would be, like, Kinda, what, yeah. you know what I mean? Like I see Google and yeah. Bitcoin, I mean, in some sorts and uh, like, like the Tesla is, is, is kind of AI, but I'm talking like about, you know, like even guys like Elon Musk, all these guys are talking about like AI, AI, right? Like where it all comes together and, and, and it's just able to, and do we're not that close to that. We're not. It, okay, talk it, to me it, about that. Like, what do you mean? Like, why do you say that? I, I read Kai Fu's book and a couple of them are like, you need at least like five or six big breakthroughs to actually make this happen. But we were only even close to one. But do you, do you have any idea what those breakthroughs are? I, I mean, I think part of the breakthrough is understanding. I mean, what the heck is intelligence? Because, so you know, all, all of this sort of like what we're calling AI, mm. um, you know, the image recognition, you know, like GPT-2, like all this stuff, that's, it, it doesn't quite match to like how we thought we might be able to go think about intelligence. You know, it's got mm. nothing to do with like anything that's kind of comprehensible to us in a, in a sense. Mm. It's not like, you know, it's thinking or it's like, you know, working through reason, rather it's using these very odd kind of pattern matching systems with enormous amounts of data and it's not really clear to us like what's actually happening behind the scenes and how well it even maps like how well the you know how the human brain works you know like th these are open questions and until we kind of answer that i'm not going to say necessarily that we're far away from having sort of true like human level ai mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but maybe the best way to put it is we have no idea how far away we are interesting Inter have you ever heard of a guy named uh, raymond kurzweil Oh, yeah. 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 And so, you know, he kind of refers to this, right? And it has been for a long time how eventually, you know, maybe in the next two or three decades, humans will figure out how to stop and reverse the aging cycle, how we'll, you know, somehow become one with computers um, and figure out how to, like, you know, live forever and conquer the stars. And or more know, likely, we just create some hyper intelligent AI that doesn't go and quite follow our goals and then it eliminates us. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, I mean, that that seems like, uh, I mean, I mean, again, according to Elon, it's like more possible than, you know, nuclear warfare. And I mean, it seems like the world goes to quite great lengths to, to think about Elon that has a lot of it. very strange ideas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nucle that, nuclear that, warfare that, is a very real risk. Mm. <laughs> you know, do not underestimate that one. But nuclear warfare in the hands of AI. It, you know, probably Sorry. can't happen. Okay, okay. But like, <laughs> you know, no, like seriously, nuclear warfare in the hands of AI mm. probably can't happen in a simple way mm. because it's not that likely that these systems are actually sort of connected to networks. 
you know, when you look like a good example is the, um, you know, the Russian like doomsday, uh, you know, mechanism that they supposedly had so that, you know, if they ever lost contact with, you know, their government buildings, all the nukes would go launch. That's mm -hmm. not actually how any of that worked. The way it actually worked was it gave human beings deep in bunkers who are pretty low down on the, you know, seniority list, um, essentially like firing codes that they normally wouldn't have access to. And you had to turn the system on. And it kind of tells you something. Well, hang on a second. There's human beings in these bunkers, you know, every single time. The way AI would actually have to go pull off nuclear war is not by hacking into systems, mm. rather by fooling human beings. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, 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 that, that's interesting. And, and a point of fooling human beings is probably plausible. That, yeah, I was going to say, is that so hard? Have you seen some of the stuff this GPT-3 thing's uh, outputting? I mean, yeah. uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. It sounds, yeah. I mean, ah, I mean, I get so many scammy phone calls that I kind of sometimes wonder why I even have a phone number. Um, <laughs> but but they're stupid. They're dumb. They're like these computers that, hey, hello. But what happens yeah. when these things start getting intelligent? And it sounds like Peter Todd. Hey, I haven't talked to you in a long time. And it's like, well, f funny oh you say God. that because someone um, just tried to impersonate me on Telegram. Oh, and Lord. I, uh, you know, well, I got someone to go send me, uh, you know, the, the text of what they're saying. It's like, this sounds nothing like me at all. It obviously wasn't written by, by an AI. It was written by a human who didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and the irony is like, I, I think we're probably at the point where, you know, assuming like unlimited technical ability, if you will, mm. an AI could have done that job better because it could have just gone in, you know, be fed in everything I've written on the internet and then come up with a more convincing bit of text that sounded more like me than the ridiculous nonsense that the scammer tried to go and pass off. Peter, do you know this Marzon? I'm gonna I'm butchering his name. Do you know this guy Marzon? He's from Argentina. He's like a bit of a Bitcoin OG. So anyway, so he wrote this this yeah. blog post on. Uh, he's like, okay, I've been playing around with GPT three. Um, yeah. You know, I went on Bitcoin Talk. I started posting all these things. Here's the feedback, and this is how it did. Da, 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 da. And then at the end of the blog post, it's like dot 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 dot. Okay, this was way, written by GPT-3. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. That was like, that gave me chills a little bit. I was just like, no, no. Okay, so that's happening. Okay, okay. So but, let but, me... but, but you got to remember, the way that thing works is you go prompt it with text. So depending on how you prompt it, a lot more of what you wrote could be in the output than you might expect. Right, right. Hmm. You know, you know, and also like that's one of the reasons why this is, you know, it's not as impressive to people who know how it works as it is to people who don't. Because hmm. people who know how it works realize, of course, you fed in a gigantic database. Uh, well, I mean, you fit in like every bit of text it could ever find, basically, which means that there's enough stuff in that database, you know, that's essentially assembled to go and recreate things that'll look like they're not plagi you know, plagiarism, but they actually are. Mm. You know, because we kind of fed in all these concepts. I mean, this is why, like, when you play with the Dungeons, you know, and not Dungeons and Dragons, um, you know, like, anyway, the, the computer games people have written with it. Like, you, mm. you go look at it and hang on a second. Like, this, there's something off about this. You know, it doesn't, the logic isn't there, but it's obviously taking this, you know, these sort of textual ideas from so many other sources. You know, and like I was saying before, that's the thing that it kind of misses. It's missing mm. this logic, which is the exact opposite of what all the sci-fi authors was kind of talking about. Yeah, yeah. No, but, you know, when you talk about how and you equate it to, like, pattern matching, I sometimes wonder, though, is, like, isn't that to some degree what humans are? Like, we're pattern matching machines. Like, I have two little Only the stupid that... ones. <laughs> okay, I was just like, <laughs> as you said that, I was like, I have two little kids. It's like, oh, yeah. I'm gonna stop there. Okay, okay, okay. Let, let's get to the point yeah. here. So, so one of my one of my goals is not to be uh, talking about like all time highs and stuff, but is to capture. So, so Bitcoin is a limited resource, right? Twenty one million, and I think the other limited resource are people's stories around Bitcoin. And I treat the Bitcoin as a bit of a singularity event in people's lives. And my first question is: is what's your story? Some people start with their first job. Some people start with like when they were kids. Some people start with their parents meeting. I don't care. But the goal is not to be like oh here's your my 30 second elevator pitch it's more like 
um, like, you know what I mean? Like what kind of little things happened uh, that kind of eventually led you to be like designed to be like what you are today? You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> like, okay, were you a geeky well, kid? Were you like a more like an entrepreneurial kid? Were you, I, I, uh, I was a very, I mean, I, I've, I've got a fine arts degree and then dropped out of a physics program. And crazy, I worked, you okay. know, a couple of years doing analog electronics design. So I, I have a rather mixed background. Mm. But I, Interesting. I, Pretty diverse. Were you ever, well, when did you get your first computer? Surprisingly late, actually. Um, and it's quite funny, like, my, my parents never actually bothered, like, you know, buying one for the longest time. So I initially learned how to program you know, sitting on the kitchen table, reading books and writing down programs on paper <laughs> and then imagining my head what, what they would be like if only I could ever run them. You know, it, it took probably two or three years of that before I actually had access to a computer at home. You know, that's ones at school, but you, you couldn't do any programming on them because they locked them all down. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah. uh, so you were intrigued more by programming than by computers themselves. Cause I mean, I was more like, you know, no, it was just a matter of like, I was, you know, uh, what'd it be? Yeah. Like, you know, a not you know, eight or nine year old. I, I, I can't buy a computer. I don't yeah, have any money. Yeah. So when did you get like, it? Like when you're in your teens type of thing or, uh, probably like, I think like 12, 12, maybe 12 or 13. And did you get into tinkering and- mode right away? Or was it more like gaming? Like most people, well, I mean, w- w- what my parents did is they went and bought a surplus $50 IBM XT, mm. which was many, many iterations obsolete even by then. <laughs> you know, they, they did not spend much money on it, believe me. But, mm. you know, it, it worked like you could go and do programming on it. That's all you need. And then eventually once I'd done, you know, more of that, well, then I finally managed to get a donated, um, uh, you know, 386 probably would be eight years after they were totally obsolete, you know, like, well, yeah, we never spent money on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then growing up, any hobbies? Uh, I don't know, chess club, uh, badminton, soccer, nothing? Rock climbing. <laughs> rock, rock climbing? Crazy. That's, yeah. that, that's quite the hobby. Like real rock climbing or, or more like at the uh, local? I'm in, I'm in Toronto. There's no mountains around okay, here. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah, no, indoors. Okay, okay. I, I grew up in Alberta, so I, I guess I could have made that a hobby, but... Uh... Well, d- depending on which direction you look, Alberta is either really, really flat or full of mountains. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Um... You know, it's, it's funny, like, Chris, because you go drive um, through Alberta into BC, and it's really noticeable as you kind of mm. see the mountains pop up on the distance, so... Isn't it a beautiful drive? I quite like it. Yeah. I mean, I my, uh, nice. all my family live out that direction, so... Oh, really? Really? Yeah. And so you said you grew up in Ontario, mostly. Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and then fine arts. Talk to me about that. Like, how did you come to that, you know, decision? Like, are you, are you, are you like a... Uh, I mean, if rock? I want to be flippant about it, the way I'd go say it was I had a summer job as doing programming and uh-huh, I uh-huh. Uh, had to do it in Perl, which is a terrible language. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, you know, I mean, I had a bunch of interests. Like, I've been doing uh, some art. I mean, I got uh, doing pottery of all things and, uh, you cool. know, also like to do electronics art stuff. So, interesting. interesting. What, why the heck not? And initially, what I actually went into was industrial design. Although, mm. I dropped, you know, I switched out of that to uh, fine art after the first year when I realized it was not very scientific. <laughs> there were. Uh, <laughs> It was a little disappointing compared to like what, what you're kind of hoping because the teachers in you know, like they just didn't understand basic physics concepts like mm. the kind of things you'd expect like people doing product design to know about mm. and it, it, you know I can remember one in particular was like this sort of gravity powered um, lamp and gravity you know that is you powered lamp okay yeah you know it's got this big weight on it right and that is you go pick the weight up you know pick it up a few feet and you let it fall down and the gravity makes the light go. And, you know, my teacher saying, oh, this won some design award. That's such a great idea. You know, hear about talking that. about okay. environmental design, yeah, like yeah, all yeah. this stuff. And I think to myself, all right, how much energy is there from a 20 pound weight falling six feet? And of course I take it physics in, uh, you know, high school. And I did that calculation <laughs> about five seconds. No, no, this is impossible. <laughs> Utterly impossible. And sure enough, the thing was a fraud. 
<sighs> but like, it really says something. Like the teachers were so clueless about like actual products and like actual industry that you know, they never caught on stuff like this. Like it, it made me realize, you know, if I'm here, I might as well just go off to arts. Like, well, why pretend this isn't bullshit? <laughs> And when the AI, AI robot gods do arrive, I mean, that's all we'll be left with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, I well, <laughs> well, of course, the, the way they're going, what we'll be left with is, ironically, all the engineering that the AI can't do. Because AI is much better at arts than it is at engineering. The exact opposite of what everyone expected. And, and any thoughts on, like, how they're generating code, supposedly? They're using GPT-3 to do so? Is that, I don't know, do you think that's even... Uh, it, it's because there's so many re-implementations of the basic, you know, the same basic ideas that mm. it's not that hard to go find something that actually matches. Mm. And if the, like, if the, t you know, text um, games that I've tried for GPT-3 are any indication, the code probably doesn't work that well. Mm. You know, you, you need to be good enough to have created the code in the first place to actually get into a usable state. You know, I, I have tried it myself, but... Hmm. Like the games written with it don't work. So I, I can't, I'm not going to imagine the codes much better. Right, right, right. But I wonder GPT 10 or GPT 100, they might get well, there. Then you get the singularity okay, okay, okay. and uh... <laughs> <laughs> the singularity. Well, yeah, anyway, so that's, that's okay. So what, what about your story though? So how does it, uh, what, what you, I don't know, around what year are we in then? Like, uh, I don't know, where does it begin? Where does it go after this? Oh, pr like, pretty like, early. Physics, I mean, by the way, as well, do you say physics? Like, was that like a yep. general interest, or like, you you just paid really close attention in school? And well, what, like, remember I, when, like, yeah. in high school. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm gonna take science classes, and physics was the easiest one. Mm. A lot of people would say chemistry is the easiest one, but I'm much better at math than I am at memorization. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I took took that, of course, and, and my high school actually had computer science classes as well, so I'd taken that, but. At the time when I was in university, mm. you know, I, I had a full-time job at a startup doing analog electronics design. So, of course, I'm going to go and, you know, get a degree. And the way the local, you know, university here in Toronto work is it was just impossible to do an engineering degree part-time. Where it was possible to do a physics degree. Did you say analog circuit design? Like, yep. not PCBs, but like what? Like, you're, you're actually designing, like, uh, what? Yeah, designing analog electronics. I mean, cool. if, uh, I was effectively in a, you know, electrical engineer. Soldering is, and I mean, shit? <laughs> well, I mean, doing all the math for it. Like, uh, mm. what, what, probably the last big project I did was to kind of do the analog, you know, front end um, for a squid controller. And a squid controller, basically, mm. long story short, is it measures magnetic fields down to, you know, the quant, like, you know, magnetic fields are quanti quantized, right? So there's a... You know, there's certain units of magnetic fields, and a squid control will measure right down to those sort of individual units, so to speak. Hmm. And then the reason why we had that was, long story short, well, the company I was working at was making a new type of gravity sensor, and deep in the bowels of this thing, converting the force due to gravity to magnetic to a magnetic field was the easiest way to actually measure that force. Hmm. You know, and gravity is a really, really, really weak force, like. In terms of the actual, the actual force we had to go um, resolve was about a, I the number was about a trillionth the weight of a fly on an airplane in turbulence, which takes some real magic to go pull that off. Wait, how do you measure the force of gravity? Well, you measure the force. Well, remember, everything that has mass, you know, effectively emits gravity, right? Right, right. You know, the the, the truth's been more complex than that, but. You know, that, that's good enough approximation, right? So if you have a, you know, a mass, a test mass, you can measure the force exerted on it. You can measure the gravitational force from things around you. And hmm. then measure the difference between that and, say, Earth. Now, the tricky thing with this is because we had to do this on an airplane, which is in turbulence and moving, you know, there is no, like, zero force reference frame. That we have access to so what we actually did was not measure gravity directly but rather measure the gradient of the gravitational field you know as in like if you have something that's really massive you know here mm. yeah, yeah and there's not something massive here 
gravity will diminish from this side to this side, right? Because there's this thing's you know emitting gravity effectively, and that emission is in a sphere. So as you go further out, it weakens. Yeah. And you can measure the difference in force between two points, and then that gets you the gradient. And the nice mm. thing about that measurement is you can do it in a differential way, as in you cancel out the force applied to both test masses at once, mm. such as from turbulence. And you know, that sounds all well and good, except the cancellation has to be really, really, really good. You know, you're trying to resolve a trillionth the weight of a fly when you're on an airplane exerting much, much stronger forces than that. So, you know, basically the, to make it all work, it's a combination of removing as much force as exerted on as possible, and then finally having, you know, incredibly tightly machined, uh, you know, essentially springs to, you know, be sure that the mechanical motion that you're kind of expecting is translating into motion of these test masses in exactly the right way. And where the squid controller comes in was, mm. well, to measure a force, mm -hmm. if you have a spring, what you're actually doing is measuring a displacement. You know, how much has this physical thing moved? Well, when you do the math out, the amount it moved was on the order of like a hundredth the width of the nucleus of a hydrogen atom, which is just absurdly small, absolutely absurdly small. There, there's no way you could... You know, you, you can't measure that with light. You can't measure it with anything, except you can measure it with magnetic fields. And the way you do that is you make it superconducting. Hmm. So if, you know, you have a superconducting object, another in a superconducting coil, if they move relative to each other. If you have a magnetic field set up there, that movement induces current. You know, it forces electrons to move in the coil. Because, you know, that's the only way you'll go can't, like, essentially, you know, Again, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but you know, superconductors, because they're perfect conductors, current flows in them indefinitely. Well, when current flows, you get a magnetic field. And for if you go move it to make everything balance out, you have to induce a current on the other side. Right? Does this mean anything? Yeah, it does actually. <laughs> yeah. Actually, multiple things, depending on what branch of engineering. Yeah, depends on what you're but, talking. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I think I think you, you actually know what I mean there. And, <laughs> I know exactly what you, you mean. Know, that was my favorite yeah. class, electromagnetic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, cool. Very interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm, hmm. Hmm. Wow. Okay. So that's fascinating. So yeah, you know, I, I also I also spent eight years in robotics. Like before I got into Bitcoin, yeah. I spent a lot of time in like hardware, software design, and I miss that world. I'm not going to lie. I miss that world. I, I kind of, like now I'm more like in software and, and I know why they call hardware hardware. Cause it's hard. Hard. <laughs> it's, uh, I think I tweeted something like the coin kite guys yeah. or to Rodolfo the other day. It's like, you have to think about, um, you know, just like just physical, so many things. There's just like shipping, manufacturing, you know, even repair. I mean, there's just like a hundred things you don't have to worry about when you're, you know, just dealing in software. Well, so. You know, I mean, when I was doing analog electronics, like the, the actual complexity of the systems I was, you know, designing was literally orders of magnitude simpler than anything I've done in software, you know, pretty much. All right, maybe one or two exceptions, but like it's, you know, it's just night and day. Mm. On the other hand, in analog electronics, you know, you can't really observe what any of it's doing, you know, especially like that type, because, you know, literally it is a countable number of electrons, which moves when the, you know, this coil moves, there that is, is so no cool. way to measure this. Like, it, you know, you just can't do it. All you can do is figure out a way to inject something into your circuit. Mm. And then from that reason, what your circuit is actually doing. All right. But point is you cannot measure the circuit itself which is completely different with, so you know, well, nearly all software where you just, you know, drop into a debugger and you get full access to everything. Hmm. You know, so I've spent my days like writing out equations and like trying to figure out, well, all right, what sort of equations map to this physical reality and vice versa. And the weird thing about that is in some ways, I would say that software is far harder than hardware. Because hmm. if you want software to actually work it is a much more challenging task than getting hardware to actually work, given what we expect from the two. 
know, we don't expect very much from hardware. So making it work perfectly in spite of all those challenges isn't actually, you know, it's not impossible. I mean, no. you know, my career doing it, there's many times when I've done a circuit diagram and designed the whole thing and it worked perfectly first try. Mm. You know, like that just doesn't happen in software. Well, one of uh, his famous quotes, I think, in Raymond Kurzweil's book is that in the end, we'll realize that we are not hardware, but we are software. <laughs> and and uh, hopefully we'll make a backup of myself. Okay, so so, uh, where, so where does your story go next? You've got physics, arts, you're tinkering with computers, I guess. Uh, well, you know. yeah. um, I mean, the thing is, I, I honestly don't quite remember how, but somehow or another, I learned about Bitcoin in sort of early 2009. And that's okay. when I was, you know, doing, uh, you know, doing a physics degree plus trying to go work full time. So I didn't really pay that much attention to it, which of course was the greatest financial mistake of my life. But <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 at least like it would be in what 2013 is when kind of I sort of became a bit more active and I, you know, started looking at Bitcoin stuff. And y y you know, the thing that kind of made me switch was the simple reality is there's no way I could have ever contributed anything meaningful to analog electronics. You know, I'm not smart enough. And analog electronics is far too old, old in the field for that to happen. You know, like when I, like I, I could literally use books a hundred years old for some of my designs because transformers haven't really changed fundamentally in a hundred years. Hmm. Whereas Bitcoin, you know, the, the funny thing about it is there's multiple terms we use in Bitcoin where I'm actually the guy who came up with, the name for the term. Like what? Well, like um, proof of sacrifice hmm. is uh, one. Uh, Merkle Mountain Ranges is uh, a big one where I, I sort of was yet another person to rediscover this basic concept. But the key difference was my name stuck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I had the much better explanation of what was going on than, uh, than the, you know, than the occasional other people who did. You know, and like coin join is another example where that one was particularly funny where literally Greg, Greg Maxwell asked me to come up with a good name for it. You know, it's, it, it's just one of those things where like it's, you know, it's not like that's particularly, uh, use, you know, important or anything. But the fact that's even possible goes and shows you how early it was. Mm. You know, it's like such a new field that things like what do we call things hadn't been, you know, hadn't been figured out yet. So wait, but how did you, okay, how did you go from like, uh, like Peter Todd that doesn't know Bitcoin to like, like, how did you learn about it? First of all, in, in 2009, was it, you're, you're not sure it just came across your radar somehow. And then in 2013, yes. how did I mean, it come I, I, I would have read the, yeah, I would have read paper. the white paper. Interesting. You know, and, and eventually got around to reading the code base. Yeah. And in 2013, what was it that drew you back? Was it just like, cause like it was kind of, you know, well, uh, it, by then I think it, had it was a little earlier than the that thousand dollar, right? Oh, right, 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 right. It was a bit earlier than that when I actually started looking at it. Like one of the first bits of code I actually wrote um, related to it was uh, my open timestamp stuff, you know, very early version of that. Mm. And, you know, and I also like learning how it works and all this. And I, I think what kind of got me into it was really just doing the sort of basic analysis and realizing, hey, you know, I've got ideas that actually make sense. And I understand this better than average. And hmm. I figured out a way to go and, you know, get an initial foothold doing consulting and figured, well, you know, I might as well go and uh, quit the day job, so to speak, and get another day job. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2013, you kind of went, uh, you said you became like a full-time consultant in the space? Yeah, like... it would be in 20, I think, yeah, 2014. Um, my Feb yeah, February 2014 would have been my, uh, my start. And th what, what I first did was, you know, the, the actual thing that kind of had a contract for a bit was uh, so-called chief scientist of MasterCoin. Because I'd, I'd criticize them for uh, all the stuff that didn't work. And they said, oh, we'll, we'll go hire you and uh, see if you can come up with better ideas. And I uh, went and did a bunch of research on that stuff, which you know, didn't last that long. But, uh, you know, kind of oh, well, I mean, no, on to other a, things. Do you know David? Which uh, one? Sorry, uh, the MasterCoin David. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I haven't yeah. heard from him in a long time. So I interviewed him recently. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but anyways, so Dave, a lot of people don't know him, but David was the reason I'd started Unicoin. Oh, well, I mean, one of the huh. reasons, but he was like, it was literally on a call with him in 2012 or whatever it was. Yeah. And he was like, 
you guys should, you know, bridge that gap and make it easier for people to buy Bitcoin. But anyways, so interesting. So MasterCoin, okay. So, uh, and if, if I'm not like butchering it, like it wasn't it kind of the first attempt to try and have like the Swiss army, like, you know, the Turing, was it Turing complete? I don't know, but like the ability no, to create, no. well, what was it exactly? It was ability it, to it do was, stuff on top of Bitcoin, right? Honestly, it wasn't that impressive. It was like, it embedded some data in the Bitcoin chain to go and do assets and it was fixed function, mm -hmm. but you know, it works well enough to go and, uh, you know, do a bit of useful stuff. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, like tether still winds up using some of that tech, you know, multiple yeah. iterations on very, kind of very bizarrely, but you know, it works like it's tested. I mean, what, what, what they need for it is not very sophisticated. It's just needs to work. I mean, no, well, let's face it, Bitcoin itself is not that sophisticated in many ways. Mm. But the important thing is it works. How do you describe what Bitcoin is to people? Like, I don't know, like if you're at a dinner table with your family or whatever, and they're like, Peter, I'm hearing you are talking about this Bitcoin thing. Tell me a little bit about I mean, something. Like, do you have like I think a little spiel or do you, do you try and, I don't know, cater it to them type of deal? Or Really the latter with also a hint of, uh, depending on how annoyed I am, I uh, <laughs> might use different strategies. <laughs> if I want to be flippant about it, I could just go say it's essentially a meme, which isn't really wrong, but it doesn't really tell you much. Yeah, it's like the ultimate troll <laughs> on society like, or something. I don't the, know. the thing is, though, like, <laughs> meme kind of gets, gets to a deeper truth there, which is it is mm. an idea. Mm. It's just an idea that, following like following the implications of it happens to be very easy because you can use software to do it hmm. you know in theory bitcoin could be this decentralized system where we all go and you know email each other transactions and go do the math you know ourselves of course that's insane it's far mm -hmm. too much work so software automates that part but you know the core of bitcoin is really the mean you know that's that's the thing that makes the software meaningful it's not what, the other way around. What is the definition of a meme? It's like an idea that spreads or yeah. what is it? Is it something like that? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, I mean, very literally, meme came out of gene. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Right? Like the, the term was, you know, created to kind mm. of riff on genes and then, you know, use that concept for, you know, for things that, you know, aren't genetic, you know, ideas basically. Interesting. A memory gene, if you will. Interesting. So it's it's a meme. And then you decide to dedicate your life to it somehow. You're like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm all about this meme life. Uh, and then and then how do you find your place in it? You know what I mean? Like, because uh, everyone has a bit of a, a different place. That's kind of one of the, like, you know what I mean? Like, how do you well, insert uh, yourself into this equation? I, I mean, I think a big part of it is what I've focused on most Um at least for the stuff that's kind of more publicly visible has been, you know, critique and ideas, you know, and like doing analysis of other things. And, you know, I mean, thank frankly, it kind of fits into consulting in general, you know, most like so much consulting winds up being go look at something a client's doing and see whether or not it makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. the, the irony there is I've, you know, I sort of, I've almost done more audits of things than I have actually building things. Hmm. But you know, I mean, I seem to be good at reading, you know, reading through other people's ideas and critiquing them and finding a way where they, you know, ways where they break. Speaking of it, okay, so maybe we'll get to that uh, later on a bit. But um, okay, so what what next? I guess happens in your thing, so in your career. So you you start becoming a consultant. Like, are there some kind of milestone points that you look back and be like, you're especially proud of? I mean, you mentioned some things in terms of like naming things and whatnot. But I mean, like open time well, to me was is kind of like I mean, a lot of people don't know about it. I feel or not enough people know about it, but. Are you able to talk a little bit more about that in terms of like what that means and like how it applies to, to like the average person or whatever, to a Bitcoin user rather? I mean, Open Timestamps is a funny project because it's sort of, it's one of those things that is so simple that competent cryptographers don't really want to work on it. You know, what Open Timestamps does is really trivial, hmm. you know, in, in like the grand, you know, the grand scheme of cryptography, you know, it's creates, 
uh, you know, mathematical proofs that are basically just series of hash functions, you know, oh, sorry, well, series of applications of hash functions that lead up to Bitcoin blocks. And why that's useful is, well, due to how the Bitcoin consensus works, we know roughly when every Bitcoin block was created. You know, that's at the very least accurate to about a day. And since hash functions are one-way functions, if you have a series of hash operations that go from some, you know, some bit of data to a Bitcoin block, well, you know that that data must have existed prior to that Bitcoin block being created. Mm -hmm. Right? They're one-way functions. You know, and like unless Bitcoin's entirely broken and all hell breaks loose, mm -hmm. there is no way to have created that data after the fact. And that turns out to be surprisingly useful. Hmm. Um, basically, you know, like the root reason why that's useful is because bad guys don't have time machines. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Right? Like, like very often you can rule out attacks by saying, well, that thing was created in the past. Thus, there's no way it could have, you know, fallen victim to this type of attack. Because that type of attack, you don't even know to do it recently. And, uh, you know, here, here's a concrete example that actually came up recently, which is these uh, Hunter Biden emails. Hmm. Okay, do tell. Well, so <laughs> the, the Hunter Biden emails, yeah, contrary yeah. to what a lot of the media will go tell you, were... Mm you know, that you were able to go and uh, authenticate them. In fact, one of them got released with the DKIM signatures on it. And one of the ways you go verify the DKIM signature, in, or sorry, step back a second. So the DKIM signature is, long story short, it's a way of signing emails to um, attest to where they came from. And this system exists basically because of spam, but because it's signing an email, you know it came from, you know, Google in this case. Now, you can go and quibble a bit on, well, I don't know, maybe his account was hacked way back when. But, like, the thing is, you know, we have very we have very good reason to believe all this happened far in the past before anyone's likely to be doing anything, you know, sophisticated. The most obvious explanation is, yes, you know, that email is real. But there is one catch, which is it's not easy. But because of how DKM is used, it's not that easy to figure out well, what is the correct public key for Google. You know, these keys get rotated and the nature of DKIM is because it's meant for spam purposes, no one really cares about the long term. Now, this isn't that hard of a problem because anyone can verify it for themselves that, oh, I have, you know, an email from back then from Google, for instance, that used the same public key. Hmm. You know, that's if I know that email is real, it's very good evidence that that public key was in fact in control of Google. But that evidence isn't transferable to others, mm. right? There's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, which open timestamps can go and bypass. And the reason why is, well, I wrote open timestamps early enough to have a timestamped email, and in fact, many, many of them, but I, I picked one for publication. Um, that has Google's public, you know, essentially traceable back to that particular Google public key. And it was timestamped as well before the Biden administration was even a thing. Hmm. So basically for that to be fake, you know, for that to not mean what it should mean, you have to assume that somehow I personally was in on this multiple hmm. years ago when I didn't even know who Biden was. Hmm. You know, it's like, it's, it, it, it's just silly. <laughs> But the beauty of it is because it's transferable proof, you know, anyone can verify this open time sense proof and verify that, yes, this email of mine existed, you know, back in what would be 20, yeah, 2015 or something. That then tells you about the Hunter Biden emails you know, through a bit of logic. Interesting. And so, so if somebody was trying to use this in their real life, like is, is something like being able to lock up Bitcoins an application of it? Like if I somehow didn't or like, no. how do, how does, how does it like, how they, 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 it? remember there's exactly one thing, which it does, which, which is, is it proves that a message existed in the past. That's it. Hmm. In, in, in particular, the proof that a message exists in the past thing, that's a subtle point, which a lot of people miss. And 
the way I like to describe it is, so suppose I have a time-stamped contract, mm. you know, in the past saying, this house I'm trying to go sell you was in fact sold to me, right? So that's, you know, one link in the chain of, you know, do I actually own this house? Because of course, if I don't own it, I can't sell it to you. And a timestamp will tell you that, yes, this contract exists in the past. But the problem is, I could have timestamped a zillion different versions of that contract. I could have timestamped anything I wanted. And in the case of selling a house, well, it's certainly logical to think that I could have just set up a fraud in advance. Mm. You know, Maybe I want to go and try to sell you a fake house. So I just go and do the easy thing and generate some contracts up front and then figure out you know, what my actual fraud will be later. You know, I could run a computer program and timestamp fake contracts for every single address in the you know entire world. The only challenge there would be getting the addresses, not actually the you know not actually like the generating part of it. That's just simple, you know, Python script. Hmm. You know, let it run for a few hours because making timestamps is free, so you can make as many as they want. Like in, in fact, sorry, here's another example which um, might help like reinforce it. You know, suppose for instance. Again, going back to Hunter Biden, suppose you know he sent some you know tweet multiple years ago, mm -hmm. and somehow that you know helped prove this nefarious alleged behavior. Well, thing is, if I had a timestamped copy of that, depending on what it was, the timestamp would be useless. You know, it's one thing, for instance, if it says, you know, if the timestamp is on something innocuous, like oh yeah yeah my car broke down. Right. Mm. And that happens to correlate with another piece of evidence that wasn't known publicly. But let's suppose that the timestamp was on a photo of him, you know, smoking his crack pipe. That timestamp is actually kind of worthless because AI can go generate, you know, AI and Photoshop can generate those images. You know, the timestamp itself didn't actually add much value mm. because the message is sort of self incriminating. You know, at the time it was generated, you would know it's bad. Hmm. Same thing as like timestamping in all of Trump's tweets as an example. It's it's a you know I'm not going to say it has no value, but it has a lot less value than people seem to think it does. Hmm. You know because you can't you, you can't use a timestamp by itself to prove that something's real. You know there has yeah. to be something else to kind of to make it that you wouldn't have been able to go fake it in the past, or you wouldn't have known what to fake in the past. You know, that can be a that can be a tricky thing. But the flip side of it is timestamps are, you know, assuming your software works, of course, timestamps are basically free, right? They scale indefinitely. I mean, yeah. I, I once timestamped literally half a billion documents, um, you know, a big chunk of the Internet Archive to be exact, with one single Bitcoin transaction. You know, just make a bigger Merkle tree. So yeah. adding timestamps to things. It may not be the best use of engineering resources, depending on the thing, but it's it certainly won't make things worse. Is maybe the way I'd go put it, hmm. you know. And I'm and always a bit cautious, to kind of promote that concept because I think in PR people will then often overstate the benefits of them. But certainly from a technical point of view, you know, I mean, just as an example, like I timestamp, you know, all my emails because why not? It can be can come in handy, and it did in the case of this uh, Hunter Biden thing. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Okay. I'm starting to follow now. Um, yeah. Peter, I have a question for you. So you said you're, you would kind of help with MasterCoin or audited and whatnot. I know, I think you were, you helped or you were part of something regarding Zcash. Well, uh, so uh, so uh, point. MasterCoin, I was never actually working on MasterCoin itself. I was oh, working was it? uh, on research. On um, research. On the, the type of concepts mm. that it, you know, that it's in similar systems needed. Mm. You know, that's like how I, like, the, like, Basically, you know, the thing I did in those couple months was go and figure out, you know, client side validation and like how to go build consensus systems without mining mm. or to be exact, how to build consensus systems without cooperative mining. Mm. You know, MasterCoin still needs mining, but the miners don't need to help in, in a sense. You know, the miners aren't validating the rules. Are you following RSK? Do you know, like the side chain essentially? Yeah, a bit. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's uh, I think it's very dubious because it, indeed, I mean, potentially even dangerous because it hmm. has the risk of changing the incentives for Bitcoin and then making mining harder, which we really don't want. 
And effectively, like RSK is effectively a block size increase from the point of view of mining, and that's not a good thing. Hmm. So, so I guess what the question I'm trying to get at is, is that you, I mean, you're from the Toronto area as well, right? So you you saw the emergence of Ethereum, right? So eventually, yeah. I think Vitalik's insight was is that you know we don't want to you know or the the core team isn't going to necessarily allow some of this like program programmability and Turing completeness and all that onto the blockchain because it'll bloat it, and they decided to go. Well, not, no, I mean, or is that, I don't know. Maybe I'm. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. That the bloat isn't the number one issue. It's mm. that the level of complexity people wanted for Ethereum has proven to be a very dangerous thing. You know, like the the the, the ability technically to rate consensus code that does all that stuff is really not there. You know, you see that how Ethereum has failed multiple times mm. due to you know due to this kind of complexity sort of coming uh, coming to bear. You know, it's it is an incredibly complex system. And it's, you know, even worse than I think it could have been. There's a lot of stuff wrong with Ethereum, technically. Um, even ignoring things like scalability is just, you know, even if your goal is to do the most charitable thing, the most charitable interpretation of what Ethereum could be as, you know, just centralized database, it's not very good at that. Can you explain Because the scripting why... doesn't make much sense. Yeah, why? Why doesn't the scripting make much sense? Uh, I mean, yeah, and then and then eventually I want to get to the staking thing as well. But like I've always, again, I, I am I did study electrical engineering. I, I have have had several jobs where I was coding, doing hard, but I don't consider myself an engineer because I just don't think I'm smart enough. So, but 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 I but I've always had this sense that that it's risky and you know, and I always felt like well, Bitcoin was kind of optimizing towards one particular goal and and always stood for something and so it was very clear for me to be like okay this is but the fact that this kind of swiss army knife approach let's be able to build anything did seem a bit reckless and that's why as a result i mean i've financially well uh, again so there, there's lost, two ways but... that mm -hmm. like, there's multiple ways of talking about this the most mm -hmm. charitable interpretation is to say all right let's ignore scalability let's pretend that we're just making a really nice centralized database okay you know that we can also distribute which frankly is not that unlike what Ethereum's turned into because so hmm. few people, you know, can easily run nodes and stuff like that. But, you know, with that charitable interpretation, you would still go and criticize them for things like the account model. You know, the account model just does not match how these systems work. In fact, ironically, hidden under the account model in Ethereum is actually a TX out model. You know, that's effectively what the primitives map to. So it, hmm. like, why would you go put that into the core of the system? It just adds complexity and a whole bunch of edge cases to this really fundamental thing of how do you go and you know, keep track of states as it, as it evolves. TX outs are so much better for that. You know, it's just such a better system. And you know, another thing is like you go look at the um, you know, gas system and there's just so much complexity in that, in terms of, what's the right way to explain it? Like, like in, in terms of the fact that they, they designed it in a way where they need, you know, to prevent DOS attacks, they need gas to be spent, even if transactions aren't accepted, you know, which is just kind of crazy. Like it adds these whole, whole new categories of things that can go happen that just never needed to happen. Hmm. But, you know, well, why does this happen? Well, ultimately, because they run into very fundamental scaling things. And that's sort of the less charitable side of it, which is what they're trying to go do, this, you know, shared consensus thing just fundamentally doesn't scale. It, you know, it's just hopeless. So it, it's sort of like the TXL model again. That is not the right way to go build, you know, these systems. You know, the, w the way you build these systems, you figure out, well, what states do I need to go keep track of? And then you figure out how to go and leverage the sort of core primitives of blockchain for that. You know, like that's how Lightning works. Lightning has tons of shared state, but it's not global shared state. Hmm. Okay, so I okay, so I guess one of the questions I'm I'm kind of trying to get at is is also is it, okay, like do you believe that 
like things like Twitter and these applications, should they be decentralized? Like, does it make sense to like have these types of public utilities or whatever you want to call them, you know, controlled by a few people? Like the, the underlying kind of um, incentive oh, yeah. or the uh, desire uh, was like, hey, let's decentralize the world. So I think so, that's so, no so In a perfect world, mm. it absolutely makes sense for things like Twitter to be decentralized. And we're probably closer in a sense, to that perfect world than I would have said maybe two years ago. And the reason why that's kind of changed is that the, the key thing that a centralized service like Twitter can add that mm. a decentralized system can't, regardless how much engineering you throw at it, is moderation. You know, what, what Twitter brings to the table that software cannot is an army of human beings behind the scenes who are, you know, managing the content of Twitter. And for, quite frankly, Part of that winds up banning, you know, being like banning things and, you know, um, de, um, what's the right term for it? Like, you know, essentially, you know, making things less visible in the AI. Because after all, like the way you, most people interact with Twitter is through a timeline that's algorithmically generated. Right. So Twitter is more useful to you if there can be AI that figures out, well, what do you want to be shown? That's a very hard problem to do in a decentralized environment. Mm. You know, it's not impossible, but it's it's certainly like, hard. Like what I'm being shown, like I don't like the AI version of Twitter. Like I, I like well, the that's, technological, like give it to me straight. What did Peter yeah. say like like a minute ago? Well, that, the, the, that, that's and why that I said that I think. possible, no? But see, that's why I said that we are living in, in a sense, a more perfect world than I would have said two years ago. Because so much like what Twitter is doing is, I think, reflective of bias and not actually like product focused if, um, decisions, if you will. Mm, mm. You know, I think Twitter is has multiple problems that it's dealing with. One is you've got two political parties who have very different visions of what Twitter should be. And, you know, and ultimately what the, what that comes down to is, well, what things should be centered on Twitter? And then on top of this, you get the problem of Twitter staff who, you know, like, let's just face it. There's many cases where we've seen where it's very likely that Twitter staff are abusing the privileges to push particular viewpoints, which I don't think is something that Twitter as a company wants to happen. You know, I suspect this is actually a disconnect between, you know, top level company goals and actual staff. And, you know, then on top of this, then you have um, people who actually use Twitter then have very different expectations. So it's, it's just a big mess. And that's the kind of thing where maybe because it's not working that well, decentralized software could still do better. You know, that's not to say it's an easy problem to solve in a decentralized way, but when you're comparing it to something that doesn't really make anyone happy, it's easier to succeed. That's what I'm saying. So, okay, okay, so let me rephrase the question. How does one go about building Twitter on Bitcoin? Well, you don't yeah. bother. Why would you need? Like, well, why do you, do you need Twitter on Bitcoin? So that there like, isn't or, this, this censorship. There isn't this um, reliance on a central party. Like, for example, I I made some stupid mistake on my Twitter account the other day, and I, on my uh, our company account, and I was locked out um, for like two weeks. And I've been sending emails to everyone. This that they finally got to it. But my point is, is like. Uh, like, wouldn't it be nice if it just worked like Bitcoin, or I just had my private key, and if I kept that, well, safe, so, so I there's could actually have two, access to my timeline, blah blah blah. Well, there's actually two options um, mm. that have been written and do actually get some use. Um, one of them is Mastodon, which is a federated system. Interesting. So, okay. you know, the simplest way to explain that is it's as though anyone could go get the you know get the source code that runs Twitter and run it themselves. And additionally, there was a feature where different people's versions of Twitter could still share data. You know, Interesting. A simple way, um, like, you know, something you use every day that's actually very close to this is email. You know, chances are you use email through a server that someone else runs, but that server is not necessarily the same, you know, server or really system of servers as the one I use, hmm. you know, you might have Gmail as an example, which is its own thing, a very complex thing, but it's still a, you know, a separate thing than my email server, which is something I go and, you know, host on Amazon EC2. 
and I run my own software for that. But because there's a protocol where they can go talk to each other, if I need to send you an email, that data can pass from you know my computer to my server to then Google server, then eventually to you. And that's exactly what Mastodon can do. Interesting. So what you're saying is, is that it's like a clone of Twitter, but you don't really need Bitcoin. So why, why bring it into it? Um, well, and you're getting that decentralized well, element, which is like everybody's kind of hosting. Is it a well, hang on. But hang on. Mm. I didn't say, or I didn't use the word decentralized. I used the word federated. Right, 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 right. Kind of like so, liquid. Well, not, not, not really like liquid though. So mm. federated is what email is, right? In that there are, you know, users themselves don't normally run an email server, hmm. although they have the option, but rather they, you know, they access email through a system of servers, which at the server level, you could say is decentralized. Hmm. Now, I should point out, there's internet infrastructure that email depends on, which is fundamentally centralized, you know, internet routing is basically centralized for like fundamental technical reasons. But if you say the internet exists, then what's sitting on top of it, you know, like email and Bitcoin, although Bitcoin's a better example for other reasons, um, you can say is decentralized. Hmm. And Bitcoin's interesting because in theory, Bitcoin can actually go work even without the internet. You know, like Bitcoin data doesn't really care what network it's used to pass around on. Whereas email, you know, your email addresses are fundamentally tied to a centralized system, which is DNS. But other than that centralized system, it's as decentralized as it could be. You know, bar, modulo certain nuances like spam protection and so on, you know, which kind of add complexity to this. But, you know, if email handled spam a bit differently, it would be trivial for anyone to go run their own server. And Mastodon winds up working like that. Now, there's another system, which is sort of a competitor to Twitter and also Mastodon, um, which is even more decentralized than Mastodon. And that is, let's see here. Yeah, Scuttlebutt. That's the name. So Scuttlebutt, it uses cryptography. Um, and well, in fact, like per Scuttlebutt user, there is a blockchain. And you have a key which signs blocks on that chain, which is just your chain, you know, purely like your timeline, essentially. And the key thing is, well, since you have that data structure, you can then widely distribute that data and anyone can validate that it's correct from where they got through. Now, this has no consensus like Bitcoin does. And the reason why that's not needed is, you know, let's suppose I use Scuttlebutt and you use Scuttlebutt. I'm interested in seeing your well, whatever the heck they call it, tweets or whatever. Surely they have some weird name for it, but we'll call them tweets. You know, your scuttlebutt tweets. I want to go see that on my computer. Well, however it is that we introduced, you know, each, you know, ourselves to each other, we can use that same kind of mechanism to just grab that data. And that could be as simple as something as well. You know, I might have a full-time scuttlebutt server and you happen to know the IP address or DNS name of the Scuttlebutt server, and you just ask it, hey, could you go give me all the latest uh, data? Or we might be separated by you know, three different links, but those three different links, well, they're, they happen to be interested in you know, my tweets or your tweets or whatever, and then they copy that data over. But the important thing is, let's suppose we have some you know, researchers in Antarctica who really don't care about either of us. They have no interest in anything we do. Well, their computers don't need to process that data because they just don't care. You know, They can go and still use Scuttlebutt within their Antarctic research base or wherever the heck they are. Mm. I mean, you know, maybe we'll uh, see Scuttlebutt on Mars one day. But this scales because people who are interested in things process the data and people who aren't don't. Interesting. And and have you heard of Blue Sky? I think that's what they're calling it. Like Jack Dorsey and these guys are trying to do something like open source on a blockchain. Yeah. Like Not even. Uh, yeah, I heard, uh, uh, oh, it, it's funny. There are many I mean, projects called anything. Blue Sky. Mm. And in fact, there's another project from many, many years ago called Blue Sky, which is not entirely unlike what I think you're describing, but I haven't really looked into this particular iteration of Blue Sky. 
And if anything, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's actually just some attempt to uh, ward off government regulation. Mm-hmm. You know, they have no, so no, guess, no reason to actually do. I guess, I, I, are you saying then that, that, that like trying to build Turing complete contracts on top of Bitcoin is not even worthwhile or even worth considering? And the well, I'm asking is like, so, let's so there, right, build a, a decentralized exchange. Let's say you want to build a DEX. Like, let's talk about yeah. the elephant in the room, the unicorn in the room, uh, Uniswap or whatever, right? Like how, okay, I agree. I've been one of Ethereum's biggest critic, right? But I mean, at the same time, they're announcing they're doing more volume than Coinbase and Binance and this and that. I don't know what they're saying. But but my point is like, isn't that a noble cause as well? Like like decentralized? Only if the, the tech works. Only if the tech works. Okay, so, but that's where I think people or I don't know, a lot of people, I mean myself, I get confused is how is it not working? You can go to their site, you can make an exchange, blah, blah, blah. But why? I mean, it well, costs an arm and a leg to make the trade because it doesn't scale. Blah. But I, I mean, I, I I haven't bothered looking into the details of like, mm. you know, some of the more specifics that are, no, you know, known sort of the, this iteration of uh, projects. But <laughs> you know, the la- last time I bothered to go and spend it, you know, it's sort of like one of the things where you, like you look at it for like 10 minutes, like how, how do you call this like decentralized? There's, you know, th- there's tons of effectively centralized things in control here mm. you know things like oracles and so on and you know once you introduce those elements why do you have this sort of veneer of decentralization you know like what was really the point there and mm. it, it's hard to come up with examples of things that genuinely truly need sort of turing completeness to go and work mm. you know it's just there's so many ways to go do things using much simpler primitives. And, and I point out, it's not that Turing completeness is useless, but mm-hmm. rather where you want your Turing completeness is in the software at either end. But it, it, can people forget that? I mean, so-called smart contracts programming is not about writing some script that you know gets stored in a transaction or goes on a blockchain or anything like that. That is not what a smart contract is. That's just some implementation detail. What the smart contract really is, is essentially the, the software on either end, and even more broadly, the understanding of the users for what the software is doing, you know, and what it means. Hmm. Lightning is a great example. The actual fundamental lightning transaction scripts are not specific to lightning. You know, anything that does something even a little bit like lightning will wind up using the exact same scripts. Because they're just so simple, you know, it's effectively like, you know, if you see this hash, go do this thing. If this time, you know, delay uh, is met, go do this other thing. Or to be exact, make this other thing possible. That's it. Well, tons of protocols can be described in those terms for the consensus part. Mm. And though in the protocols that have that property tend to be things that scale because, of course, they don't put all their data in one place. Hmm. Yeah, they also tend to be uh, a lot more reliable because you can debug the software on either end and get it working. And the thing you were depending on, which everyone depends on, is then so much simpler. Um, is, I have a question around Bitcoin privacy, Peter. What, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, uh, like it's becoming clear that, you know, regulators are far more scared of things like Monero and some of these other, you know, like privacy centric coins or whatever assets. Right. And, and they feel like, I guess they've got a handle on, on Bitcoin and some of these more, these different crypto assets. And just curious, like what, you know, there, there's this, like, I think recently it came out, the chain analysis is like the second biggest crypto company. And, and Rodolfo made some nice, uh, interesting remarks about that. I saw on Twitter, but curious, what, what are your, what are your thoughts on privacy and Bitcoin? Cause it's something I think about and I don't know, do you know what I'm, you know what I'm getting at with this? Well, you, yeah. the, the curious thing about it is, so there's really two sort of levels of privacy that are relevant here. One is the on-chain transaction and, and the other is how people wind up actually using Bitcoin these days, which you know, is a big, you know, frankly, a lot of transactions happen on exchanges because a lot of transactions are really about buying and selling Bitcoin. And, you know, in like essentially price discovery, you don't actually need to get to a chain 
to go and perform that. So, you know, truth be told, chances are the majority of Bitcoin transactions in the, you know, in the sort of meet value moving sense are actually happening on exchanges. You know, in the same way that the vast majority of, you know, stock trades, if you will, are not, you know, stock certificates getting moved around. It's the numbers in databases of databases, you know, three levels removed, because that mm. just happens to be the most convenient way to do those trades. Right. You know? maybe, that, maybe that's not quite the right analogy, but, you know, I, I, I think you see my point there. Like, mm. there's just so much activity that happens for relatively niche financial reasons. And then in terms of the sort of more everyday use of Bitcoin, Lightning is working really, really well. Hmm. You know, like I, I, if, what, if I can pay Lightning by Lightning. Wallet? I, Blue Wallet? What do you use? Um, on my phone, I keep, uh, well, I, I keep a Claire around for, you know, because it's a, not perfect, but, you know, it's a, basically a decentralized wallet where, um, you know, you're not relying on their server. And then I use blue, you know, I keep blue wallet around because it's essentially because it's the opposite of that. It's like the most managed wallet you get. So if something goes wrong with my Claire wallet, because I, you know, didn't refill a channel or something, it's very likely I'll be able to go and do something useful with my uh, blue wallet because because of the trust, you're then getting access to all these channels. You and know, how much are you that could kind of come in handy. How much are you paying in fees, uh, Peter? In so terms little, of, like, I've never bothered looking. It's like minuscule, like atomic, nothing. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. Maybe I haven't been paying attention. I've been paying more fees than I should. But every time I go look at it, it's like, oh, I paid a tenth of a cent or a hundredth of a cent for this. Who cares? Yeah, Peter, what, what, can, what, can, what can exchange owners, right? So, you know, I, I recently worked for some big exchanges. I started India's first one. Um, we have a million and a half users in India. Um, what are some things that, that you recommend exchange owners and whatever, like entrepreneurs do to do two things to make, obviously, the cost of transactions cheaper? Like, so I think Lightning might play a role there, but uh, and also more more privacy and, and you know privacy isn't just about like bad guys right i don't even tell you well like, so, privacy so, is about, yeah yeah go ahead so here's where i was kind of going with lightning which is mm. lightning doesn't have perfect privacy but it does have much much better privacy than bitcoin um against most threat models and the reason is because when you do a lightning transaction it's ephemeral between the parties who care about it you know mm. if i like if i go and send you a bitcoin on chain, the fact that transaction happens is recorded forever in a public database, you know, that everyone has a copy of. Whereas mm -hmm. if I go pay you over Lightning, you know, however many hops are between me and you, that's only servers that even process the data. No one else has to know. It, it, the interesting thing is like, this is sort of a fundamental property of systems at scale. Systems at scale will always have better privacy, or, or really, put, or put it a different way, going from a decentralized system that doesn't scale because it gives everyone, you know, every bit of transaction data to something that does, has to improve privacy against some threat model. Mm. You know, and, and I'll give you, you know, a kind of a funny example of this. If I go from paying you with Bitcoin to paying you with PayPal, my privacy has actually improved in the threat model where I trust PayPal. <laughs> like, it, that isn't necessarily a great threat model, but it is still better than Bitcoin for a lot of purposes. You know, like, mm -hmm. now China, you know, doesn't know that I might have paid you. That's probably good. You know, it's, yes, I have this big sudden exposure to PayPal, but, like, it's interesting how it is fundamentally impossible to make a scalable system without this property. Because the only way you can make things scale is by not broadcasting data to the whole world. Like you, you cannot do worse than Bitcoin in terms of privacy without doing something stupid, like say, you know, putting identities right onto the blockchain itself. Like the, the sort of the category that Bitcoin is, which is things that aren't really protected by crypto and are broadcast to the entire world. It's hard to do worse than that. Ethereum actually has because of the account model, but 
<laughs> okay, so, so if, so, if you're competent, okay. it's hard. Yeah, to no, I, I totally that. see what you're saying, right? Because I totally see what you're saying in the sense that, yeah, it's. I mean, it's. Uh, it's not good to use Bitcoin for criminal activity because, yeah, you know, unless you're, yeah. Well, although I, 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 I point for that. that. It's like, if you're going to go use something for criminal activity, mm. I mean, Bitcoin is probably going to work a lot better than, uh, you know, some people would like you to believe. Mm. You know, some people like chain analysis as an example. Mm. You know, the impression I get talking to sort of people in that industry is a lot of these products are bullshit. Hmm. You know, I mean, obviously, chain analysis, they'll have database and stuff, but the the data that goes into this these things is not really as certain as they would like you to go believe. Hmm. Because Bitcoin does have some, you know, level of privacy. Like, as I just said, we don't have accounts. You know, it's not actually quite that trivial to just go and track transactions through. So, I mean, look at this way. I'm not going to... I'm not going to say, you know, you should go and uh, start the next Silk Road using mm. pure on-chain Bitcoin transactions, but I'm also not going to say you shouldn't. <laughs> if you if you have a strategy for how you're going to make those Bitcoins more anonymous, such as say, you know, running them through CoinJoin or, you know, sticking them through Lightning channels, you know, sending them through a different currency entirely, like there's tons of different uh, strategies here and you're probably better off using more than one. Like Bitcoin privacy is still so much better than, than the sort of PayPal privacy if PayPal is, um, you know, in your threat model. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. But, uh, like, it, it, see how see how sort of asymmetrical it is, right? Mm. If you are concerned about someone other than the central third parties, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to do that much worse, but. There's still less data leaking on the Bitcoin blockchain if the people you're worried about are the sort of people Visa and MasterCard, as an example, will give data to. And that's probably a relatively big list. Um, you know, there's no there's no laws saying they can't in most places. You know, I, I believe the European Union would be an exception there. But like <laughs> getting transaction, you know, getting credit card data is probably not that hard, you know, especially if you have a court order. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And unfortunately, getting court orders... Well, in fact, I should point out, you don't necessarily need a court order. Of course, you can go fake one. Because mm. when you look at the nuances of this, like there's lots of ways to get this data out. So what is it about Bitcoin that you find most interesting? Like, I mean, you've been around for a long time, right? Well, what is it? Is it just, is it the, you know, yeah, just curious. So, so I think there's two ways of answering that. One is what I think is most interesting for society. And the mm. other is what I think is most interesting in terms of the technology. And okay. I think what's, and I wouldn't even say interesting, for, I think what makes it valuable for society is it, you know, it is a tool to solve this fundamental problem that we're facing, which is we need uh, electronic alternative to cash. Like cash is incredibly important for democracy. You know, you cannot have a free society without cash. You will go and find some despot, you know, using your electronic data against you. And in fact, um, you know, quite a few years ago, I had a really creepy, um, you know, example of that, that that I saw with consulting, which is through an intermediary, I was asked if I wanted to go work on this new blockchain project. And, uh, you know, to kind of describe the requirement, said, well, you know, we're going to do this uh, replacement for cash. Um, it's going to go and, you know have a blockchain for all transactions and you know we want good audibility of this we want like everyone to be AML KYC'd and also we want every transaction to happen on the system to include the details of who paid who and what they were paying for effectively they wanted to upload the receipts to this chain and of course who would run the chain you know some central third party and i kind of asked well, right, well what's this actually for and they kind of hummed and hawed and i eventually got them to admit it was supposedly for some dictator in Africa who, you know, I mean, realistically, it was probably some bureaucrat who was trying to go and come up with a good idea for, you know, job security. And fortunately, it sounds like they were bumbling enough that, you know, this never actually happened. But, like, you know, had this been more competently done, yeah, you could easily imagine a country switching over to this and just completely eliminating financial privacy. And it's just so obvious why they do that. If you're a dictator, you absolutely want this info. 
because it makes it trivial to go crush your political opposition. You know, like even something as simple as having a protest. Where are you going to go buy the signs if you can't use cash? Well, you certainly could go buy them, but now they know, oh, gee, who on earth bought, you know, 1,000 wooden stakes in another 1,000, you know, plastic, you know, panels? I wonder what that was for. Probably a protest. <laughs> like, like it, it's just, it's such a trivial thing, yet even that, losing your financial privacy is disastrous for security. You know, like, look at Hong Kong, where... People were, well, you know, where there were enormous lineups um, at the transit stations because people were not using their oyster, you know, their links to their real identity oyster cards. Because suddenly, oh shit, you know, if we go do this, the government can go trace what protests we've been to. You know, it's not the only way they can go trace it, but like removing cash is a really, really big deal. And there are tons of people who want to go remove cash. And Did you hear you know, what it is in essential. India? Did you happen? Did you hear what happened? Yes, the demonetization. What an absolute clusterfuck. Great, great advertising for Bitcoin, though. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, think, like, yeah, yeah. It, it, the crazy thing about that is, you know, you know I'm sorry, I'll probably offend some Indians, but um, simple reality is, even for their goals, they turned into a gigantic disaster. You know, it was just so badly managed, which in some way, I don't know, maybe is a good thing. At one point, you they know? had fighter jets flying out bags of cash. Yeah. The ATM machine. Yeah. That just had, what a, what a uh, mess. Hundreds of people waiting in it. It's pretty sad. Pretty sad. Um, okay. So I, I guess if I had to sum it up, like free, privacy and freedom. Freedom is like your, your, your number one thing. And then privacy is at a part of freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the technical side, what I actually am working on is kind of things built on Bitcoin, you know, like open time stamps example, which, you know, frankly, aren't going to impact society as much as Bitcoin itself will. Mm. But, you know, I think why I've kind of gravitated to that side of things is, big, you know, the core bit of Bitcoin is actually working really well. Mm. You know, there's, there are things that you can go and improve in Bitcoin. I mean, the upcoming, um, you know, taproot proposals, um, you know, that may, may be a soft fork, like that's useful, but it's, it's incremental improvement. It's not like enabling, I mean, I guess I shouldn't quite say it. It, it is enabling new things, but it's, you know, it's a different class of new things than going from say PayPal to Bitcoin, right? You know, it's making the things we have nicer, better, faster, cheaper. And, you know, what I'm working on things like home timestamps, I think for that narrow thing, I can make a bigger, more interesting contribution. Interesting. And, and, and I guess the question around like how, how any, any suggestions on, and like how exchanges can be, I mean, like, like we talked just, a little bit about DEXs. We talked, I don't know, about privacy. Get some lightning and nodes and uh, lightning put in nodes, payments yes. for that. I yeah, mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's a, the simplest no obvious thing to do. Yeah. It, it's, Done. The, the honest truth of it is like, the nice thing about lightning nodes is there's an obvious reason to do it, which is they scale. And the transaction fees are cheaper. And if people then want to figure out how to go make their Bitcoins more private at the other end, I mean, they can do it, but you're already doing pretty well just by having a lightning node. Mm. You know, I, considering the political climate, I would, I would not, I mean, it's not like exchange is doing more privacy is a bad thing, but the way I put it is, they should think for themselves over how they want to go do that on a case by case basis. You know, there isn't a blanket statement that easily applies, you know, given the reality is that, you know, regulators are looking for a fight and the right strategy for different exchanges will be different. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know? and, and, so, and so Peter, in terms of your, I guess you said you're a cryptography consultant, right? But you mostly focus on yep. like Bitcoin projects. Um, how, how do like, what's your ideal customer? Like, what, what, like, I mean, I'm sure you get a lot of people coming to you being like, uh, Oh, I got it. Like, like the person you mentioned, right. And some dictator from Africa, but like, well, what, <sighs> what do you consider a win? Like when, like what type of, uh, you know, clientele? I mean, I mean, you know, something that's doing something reasonably ethical and uh, you know, like something I've done you know, quite a few times is um, uh, audits of uh, procedures and code bases to go keep, uh, you know, Bitcoin secure. You know, that's kind of one of these sort of no brainers. I mean, you know, 
trusted third parties are going to need to go and hold Bitcoin on behalf of people for tons of reasons. Yep. You know, whether temporarily or for, you know, things like businesses. Mm. And yeah, that's interesting, useful work. Simple as that. And any, any kind of tidbits on that in terms of, I mean, like aside from, let's say, multi-sig and uh, maybe maybe cold cold storage or hardware wallets or well, whatever? Is so I think the thing obvious? that's really um, underappreciated, um, and maybe I'll back, back up a bit and say, you know, the thing that I think people misunderstand about businesses in terms of holding Bitcoin is businesses are third parties, you know, at every level. Yeah. Right. Every employee in a business is a third party with respect to the business itself. Mm. So it's tricky to go do like, you know, it's tricky to do things where you're avoiding these kind of internal risks. And then the second part of that is knowing what should happen is surprisingly tricky. And what I mean by that is, well, suppose you're running an exchange, right? You may go keep the private keys for those Bitcoins secure. But if the back end mechanism allows them to be spent for a bad reason, you've just failed. Mm. And this has happened, you know, because uh, there's been quite a few thefts that have not happened by stealing private keys, but rather by putting in false orders. Hmm. And what makes this really hard is it's very difficult to avoid your website being the being a single point of failure, hmm. you know, because how do customers interact with your service through the website? Mm -hmm. You know, like, do they even interact with it, your service in any other way? Usually not. Hmm. And for, you know, some clients where we've been talking about very, very high value stuff, you know, potentially billions of dollars in value um, stored, I've kind of had to tell them, well, you know, we really need an entire separate authentication mechanism to authenticate the transactions. You know, not multi-sig for the coins, but rather multi-sig, in a sense, for the business process. Like, are you talking HSMs here, or where, where are we going with this? What do you mean, like... Uh... Oh, no, something much simpler. Remember, mm. you have a customer, all right? Uh, so mm. let's suppose, you know, you're a, you're a, tr you're a trusted cons um, you're a trusted holder of Bitcoin on behalf of other companies, right? You know, that's a thing that's happening these days. Of course. You need to ensure that if Bitcoin is transferred from your vault that you're holding on behalf of the customer to some other place, that order was authenticated properly. Now you may have multi-sig on the Bitcoins themselves, but if you just have a website, the website's HTTP servers are a single point of failure because oh, they see. can be hacked and put in a false, false order. Hmm. So quite literally like, you know, I will give uh, details on the you know exact customer, but effectively, you know, an example process I recommended for a client was to have an entirely separate database to mirror these very very high value accounts to quite literally go and you know do phone calls to verify against you know other corporate people just to make sure that say a twenty million dollar withdrawal actually should happen. You know, this all becomes like a set of risk trade-offs and, well, you know, what's the value of all this stuff? But, like, there's a bunch of nuance to this that's really tricky because it's not enough to keep the private key secure. Interesting. Um, hey, Peter, I didn't even realize it's almost like uh, I've almost, like, eaten up all of our <laughs> time here, man. This has been super fascinating and my, uh, I think I might have smoke coming out of my ears right now. <laughs> uh, but but I was going to say, dude, where does, uh, okay, we just, actually, one more final, okay, one truth that you hold that most other Bitcoiners would disagree with you on. So, like, Peter Thiel's kind of, like, contrarian. Oh, truth that I hold. One truth you hold that most other Bitcoiners or whatever people in Bitcoin disagree with you on. You know, if I'm going to go think about this logically, I would not be surprised if thinking climate change is very likely happening is one of them. Wait, sorry. So you do I, believe it is happening or do you think it's a hoax? Sorry, I've missed that. I mean, I kind of have to simplify a bit, but you could like r roughly say, yeah, yeah, climate change is real, right? And the thing is, like, it's so I picked that as an example because it's sort of one of those things which is actually kind of easy to infer with politics. But the problem with that example mm. is I don't really know how diverse Bitcoin is. 
You know, like that's interesting thing. But what you asked is a question that's hard to answer hmm. because what is the Bitcoin we're comparing to? Hmm. You know, I may think of the Bitcoin of people I know in person who go to a particular type of conference. Right, right, but right. There are not enough billionaires in that population for them to be representative of Bitcoin as a whole. I, I, I'm picking up what you're putting down. Yeah, are you into yeah. the stake thing too? Like supposedly you're supposed to only eat stake if you're a Bitcoiner now or something. <laughs> well, you know, great example. There. I mean, I do know Bitcoiners who are vegans. So, but I, I, I kind of fit somewhere in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And, I, was gonna say, know, I, I, I think it's interesting how the, I, I think what, what happened with the stake thing is it's just a particularly visible example of something that says a lot about Bitcoin or mindset, which mm. is, you know, they're willing to go ask questions and, you know, think for themselves about you know, what medical evidence says. And mm. if you actually look at the science, mm. the medical evidence is not that steak you should, is something you should never eat. The medical evidence is actually pretty clear that vegan diets are, while not impossible to be healthy, it requires a lot of effort, which in practice means they're risky. You know, and that's the sort of thing that Bitcoiners, I think, are good at f figuring out. It's, it's also why, like, the global warming thing is interesting because there's a lot of nuances to that question. You know, it's much easier to argue, as an example, that our measurements of rising CO2 are correct. That is something tons of people can independently verify. I mean, I'm surrounded by it. You know, I literally can just go buy a CO2 meter, start writing down those numbers, and, you know, keep doing that for a few decades, and you can go and keep track of it and see an increase. You know, that's sort of the, um, that's sort of the independent verification, which, of course, is kind of what Bitcoin is based on. Um, similarly, the basic physics of climate change, a lot of that's pretty easy to understand. You know, you can go look at, you know, how does infrared lights interact with, you know, CO2 in the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. But where it gets tricky, and I think where things start getting a bit muddled, is questions of, well, what will actually happen in the future? Because the climate is really complex. And I honestly would say I don't have that much faith in the predictions of the scientists. The problem is I think they could be wrong in both directions. Right? Mm -hmm. They could easily be underestimating global warming as well as overestimating it. You know, like... I, either could be true, you mm -hmm. know, and and I say that basically based on well, I know how hard it is to model complex systems, and it's easy to get mistakes in either direction. So it's, really, what that says is, be you know, precautionary principle makes a lot of sense because after all, we're going to run out of, you know, fossil fuels anyway. We're much better off keeping them in the ground. No, but, I wonder. I wonder what the numbers look like right now, given that the whole world has been on pause for six months. I mean, like there, there there's hardly a difference. Yeah, it's hard, hardly a difference. But I mean, wouldn't you expect it to go down or something because no one's driving? I mean, everyone's literally stuck at home globally. Have you like, looked outside lately? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, in most places, there is a ton of traffic. There is less than before, but not by much. And, mm. you know, and I think this gets down to, again, another one of these things where I think Bitcoiners, I found, do a better job of this. Because they go mm. back and, you know, certainly more often than, say, people I knew when I was in fine arts. They go back to primary source and say, all right, does driving make a difference? Oh, funny enough, you actually go look at the breakdowns and eliminating all driving hardly puts a dent in it. Meanwhile, you know, the apartment I'm in, which is heated for what is probably negative four degrees weather right now, that uses a lot of energy and lockdown does not change that. If anything, lockdown is actually making this problem worse because hmm. people are moving out of dense cities to much less dense suburbs. You know, like, true, true. ironically, <laughs> for you know, a group of people who are yeah. promoting lockdown, it's an opportunity to be a great economic um, reset mm. to go fight climate change. The first thing they've done is increased emissions hmm. by changing where people live. You know, it's it, it'll be a long term disaster for cities at the rate things are going, which is a disaster for the climate. And I think it also says a bit about how non scientific people are. Because hmm. people who look at cities and think there's no way that's environmentally friendly. You know, they are all dirty and stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But no, no. You put all this badness in one place and leave everything else untouched. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like 
cities are more efficient. You know, they, they don't look environmentally friendly, but they're far better than miles and miles of suburbia. Hmm. But that's the sort of thinking I think you see in the Bitcoin community, because there's just a bit more of that sort of evidence based and sort of independent thinking, not just trusting what some people go say, hmm. you know, and of course, also just plain being scientifically competent. I mean, uh, uh, there's a lot of are, fine are arts cow, grads who aren't. Are, are, cow, are, are cow farts a serious source of uh, CO2? Well, yes and no. Um, well, first of all, they're not a source of CO2 um, hmm. in any meaningful oh, methane, matter. Sorry. Yeah, methane, which has a much higher global warming potential. Hmm. You know, essentially the, the mechanism by which CO2 warms the planet, methane does far more. But the catch is methane doesn't last forever. So depending hmm. on what time scales you're looking at, either you're really concerned about methane or you're not worried at all. And when you actually look at the inputs, depending on the, you know, depending on where you live in the world, it's quite frequent that actually calories from beef or particular protein from beef are far more environmentally friendly. Hmm. It just depends on how exactly are we, you know, growing cattle. And where that kind of comes down to is, well, why do we even have cattle? Because humans can't eat grass, and you know, and cows can. Like that—that that is why we've domesticated these animals because they can eat things we can't. Hmm. And the, in many places, the soils just aren't suitable, or you know, the local conditions just aren't suitable for growing food crops. You know, to do that requires more energy than just leaving a whole bunch of land relatively untouched and letting grass grow. And then what about that same question outside of, and by the way, I, I, I know we're at 1231. Do you have like a few more minutes here or do you got to? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, okay. Fine. Uh, and that same question, but as it pertains to the world at large. So outside of our little microcosm of like Bitcoin or whatever, any, any contrarian, like obvious things that you see that, that I don't know, that most people are kind of. Well, I, I mean, it, it, and of course these days, this isn't actually that contrarian, but Unlike many people, I agree with the science, which is that lockdowns have gone and proven to really not work. You know, like masks have proven to not really work. Like there's tons of stuff that bizarrely, the somehow the media claiming to be, you know, for the science has divorced itself from the actual science. It's mm -hmm. one of the strangest phenomenons, you know, I've seen in my lifetime. Hmm. Although maybe it shouldn't be so unexpected because we already did see that with, you know, politically controversial science. You know, it's it's just a biological fact that on average, men and women are different in tons of things. Now, but science being inconvenient, it's also a biological fact that the dip, that the variations within those populations overlap by a huge amount. You know, so basically, like long story short, neither side's happy with the science. And I think what we've seen in the left, and I think this happened to a bigger degree than in the right, is because so many of the left's you know, really strongly held positions don't really match up to science quite right. I think they've got a habit of just ignoring it, you know, and essentially denying it, which is really ironic given the rhetoric. Whereas I think the more, you know, kind of hand waving, but sort of the, the political right, because so many of the things they care about most are not actually about science at all. You know, like the, like, Abortion is a great example. Science cannot tell you whether or not a fetus is a human being. That is not a scientific question. It can tell you a lot of things related to it, but like the fundamental question of should abortion be illegal or not is not a scientific question. Hmm. And that's one of these sort of like key cornerstones for a lot of the right in many, you know, many parts of the world. Hmm. Well, right there that says they will have an easier time being scientific on other things because it doesn't conflict with these sort of core things. Where on the left, you know, a lot of the sort of extreme left, they go push for gender equality and things which, you know, the biology just isn't going to let that happen. You know, I'm sorry, but you're always going to wind up with more men who are stronger than women in certain ways, which will obviously translate into overrepresentation of men in many types of jobs and things like that. Mm. And the moment you go and kind of say, well, this is wrong and we, you know, and this you know, shouldn't happen, we got to go fight it, you very quickly start denying science. And that's just an ugly, slippery slope. You know, I, I think where the right has done that most is things like, you know, global warming and pollution. But like, I don't really see some of that stuff is all really all that fundamental to the 
really what the right means. I think most of that just comes out of, you know, bad, you know, bad incentives with corporate donors and stuff. You know, I, I think it's quite possible to have a coherent sort of right wing message that says, yeah, global warming is real. Let's go tax CO2 or something, uh, right? Are, are you following like, this like voter fraud stuff in the U.S. or whatever a proclaimed broader voter yeah. fraud? Yeah. No one's talking about I know Nick Zabo tweeted something or whatever, but I was a little bit surprised that, I mean, at least it's the five C. It's like hundreds of thousands of like fake votes like uh and no one's even like uh, well, the media no one's even picking up on it and it's not like and here's the thing people are gonna think i'm crazy because if i bring this up with my like family at like barbecues is that, or uh, zoom calls sorry uh then what ends up happening is is people think you're nuts but it's like they actually have video they actually have video well and, hang like, on there, there's, a, there's a much simpler <laughs> there's a much simpler argument which yeah. is you can find examples of democrats claiming voter fraud after the last election right <laughs> So I'm sorry, like, why don't we just use the same standards? Why shouldn't yeah. they be able to talk about, you know, alleged voter fraud? Yeah. And it, yeah. it certainly is easy to, it, it, you know, basically going by the standard of what has the other side admitted to in court? It is very easy to find a couple of, you know, a couple examples of things where they, you just kind of scream out, you say, nobody was taking election integrity seriously if these things could happen. You know, I'm not saying that that's pure, that's evidence of fraud by itself, but, you know, you go look at things like, you know, this water pipe that supposedly burst and required, you know, the, you know, election counting office to be evacuated, you know, so they could do repairs. It's like, well, they, they basically just admitted that never happened. So why were you like, how was it that no one thought, oh, hang on this election? We should take every measure we can to make sure observers stay in there. And this is, you know, 110% above board. Like, it, it's hard to explain away as a mistake. You have to be really incompetent for that kind of decision-making to happen. Or you have to be so partisan that you just don't care. You know Dominion? It, you know Dominion? That they're based in Toronto or some shit? Like this company that makes all these voting, uh, I think they need yeah. to look at like oh. Bitcoin or something or open timestamp. Oh, I don't know. When they need no, to no, no. Shit out. no, no, <laughs> no. They should do what Canada does and have hand counted paper ah, ballots. Ah, what an idea. A system that is so trivial, any idiots can go and help audit it. Do you know how it works? Like, I mean, like, as in like, how do they prevent what happened in the United States? They just don't use machines in Canada? Is that like kind of it? Like they just literally have people? Well, so, so the there's loop? two sides of it, right? One is that... There are allegations of uh, machines counting votes incorrectly. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the way that kind of stuff has been handled has been denial rather than the obvious, well, let's just go and do, you know, let's go do proper audits that everyone can go see in a sane way on kind of both sides. You know, there's been a bit of that done, but like not in, again, this kind of goes to the, the most obvious thing about this is the other side doesn't care about whether or not it looks, you know, it looks, um, it, you know, it looks like it was done right, right? Hmm. Like that's the easiest thing I think to go and argue for. And that's always a bad sign. Now, the way Canada works is every ballot gets hand counted, um, at least at the federal level. Some of the, you know, some of the other elections in Canada is different, but, you know, at the federal level, it's still hand counted ballots. Now, the catch there is mail-in ballots are deadly for this kind of system. Because you're adding you know, third parties. Yeah, the post well, office. Well, Bitcoin is the post office. Yeah, fundamentally, the post office is a trusted third party in a mail-in ballot system, and it's not hard to imagine how you could have a whole bunch of Democrats, you know, very left-wing in the post office who might want to go help with some fraud. But also, I'd say more likely is because mail-in ballots are kind of so insecure for a whole lot of reasons. You don't, need, you don't need a conspiracy for this. You just need a bunch of people turning a blind eye to rule violations for, you know, in some places, but not others. You know, just look at, for instance, how many ballots were invalidated. Not very many compared to other elections. There's something very odd going on there that just doesn't look right. You know, why is it that a high, you know, a significantly higher percentage of ballots got accepted as valid that would have absolutely turned the election. You know, like what's actually going on there? And I think your simplest explanation with the least amount of malice, so to speak, is a lot of the poll workers, you know, of course, 
a lot of them are going to wind up being Democrats, and also not being in a position where they have much um, supervision, well, they wouldn't necessarily put into big ballots. They're not going to prevent fraud. You know? And a lot of fraud is simple things like, well, I don't actually live there anymore, you know? or I'm not actually you know, eligible to vote for some reason. Like it's, and it's also stuff where I think people can rationalize it by saying, well, every vote counts. Those people should have been able to go vote. You know, particularly things like illegal immigrants voting. Um, that's something I think that you know a lot of Democrats would say, absolutely, I'm willing to break the law on this. They should be allowed to vote. And that's what makes this tricky because it's not like this is, you know, I'd say most probably this is not some obvious conspiracy. This is a lot of people with very little ethics willing to let things slide and working together to kind of let let things happen that shouldn't have. And what's ugly about this is let's suppose Trump wins, you know, these court challenges. The most likely way he'll win and you know win the election will not be by uncovering an obvious fraud. It'll be by you know getting courts to agree, well no, you changed the rules in ways that are illegal and you accepted a bunch of legit ballots cast by people, but the ballots themselves are invalid for reasons like, you know, they cast them after the election date, right? That's, that raises tons of ugly questions. You know, how is the public going to respond to that if, or at least half the public's going to respond to that if they didn't get, they, they didn't win the election because of a bunch of so-called technicalities. Certainly, you know, four years ago, they would have happily won the election on technicalities, but it, it's just, it's, it's the kind of thing that sort of can spark civil wars, and there's there's nothing nice about it. I mean, even like these machines, right? I mean, if if there isn't something that should be built like open source and transparent and by the people, again, like, you think you'll be voting machines, the, no? Or <laughs> the fundamental problem with this is technology just isn't that transparent. Counting mm. votes is a really really simple problem. You know, you oh, are man. more than smart. Yes. You are more than smart Man. enough to count votes. And you've right? been that smart since probably about age five. <laughs> like, like, literally, when did you learn how to count? This is not rocket science. This yeah, my is kid's really, got really it on lockdown. She's three now. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So, we well, just I, I, I haven't been around enough kids to know when do kids <laughs> learn how to count, to be honest. But you, you get my idea. But, yeah. The, the issue there is. I, like the, the hard part is getting the political will to kind of do this stuff because the fact is people go make money on selling voting machines. You know, mm. it's, there's just bad incentives there. And, and you hear and, these people talking in court and how the machines kept getting jammed and they'd have to recount them and this. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Why even use a machine? Just count yeah. them, right? Just have them. Well, and, and, and also make another argument, which is even if the machines work better, then, you know, are more, count the vote more accurately than human, um, you know, human counters, basically. I would still trust the humans more than the machine in the context of politics. And the reason why is mm. that if you set the standard, well, we will always do this with a human count, there isn't room for things to get worse. You know, there isn't room for things to get better. I mean, let's face it, human beings make mistakes. If you do a count with human beings, you're going to get, you know, 0.1% or 0.01% of the count wrong, which is a small enough margin to win elections, but it doesn't matter because if you, you know, if you win an election by another 50 votes that were counted in the wrong direction, you basically got the result correct anyway. You know, if that is a genuine mistake that happens by accident, by humans in a way where there will never be that that level of error will never get worse. That is a much better system to have than a system where, yes, you may count the votes more accurately, but who cares? Because what we're worried about is how inaccurately could they be counted? You know, getting another right. 0.1% hmm. totally meaningless. You know, yes, it will swing elections, you know, if, you know, he, human beings are you know, making mistakes, but it doesn't matter because the, the result was close enough. But the failure modes of machines are terrible. Mm. Yeah, and the yeah, moment you start allowing them in, you start allowing the political process to evolve to then let worse machines in. And I think this is something a lot of academics get wrong. You know, they go look at voting machines and think, well, we're going to use better tech. Well, that's not the problem. The tech mm. isn't the problem. The problem is the politics of how do you ensure that good tech is selected. 
the only technology that we seem to know how to select reliably is human beings counting pieces of paper. That is something that's simple enough to understand. People can evaluate different, you know, different versions of that tech is in which one's better. Mm. That's and why Dominion voting machines are terrible by academic standards. Mm. You know, they're for, for an electronically counted election. They violated so many security principles. You know, it's like and, no and academic would have ever designed them. But it's possible because the moment you open that threshold, you get politicians who don't know the difference between a Dominion voting machine and something that's actually, you know, somewhat secure, which makes the entire system insecure. Now, if you're, say, you know, running the Free Software Foundation or, you know, the Debian Foundation, yeah, go ahead and use electronic voting. You know, the people running your foundation are computer programmers. They'll figure it out. Not to mention if you screw up, you know, the Free Software Foundation isn't that important. Debian's not that important. <laughs> like, but elections, there is just no good way. You know, it's trusting experts is a terrible idea. If you have you ever thought about Ubi, this whole universal basic income thing again, um, and, and like uh, the obvious Bitcoin answer obviously is to be well, I mean, not Bitcoin answer, but the obvious my in, initial reaction is to not like government forced anything, right? Because they're just printing money or whatever, or taking from certain people. But I'm curious to know if like some sort of humanitarian effort long term is i don't know needed just given how much poverty there is in the world and then how does one try and address that at scale um i'm just curious like have you i mean ubi's kind of becoming a reality with some of all these handouts from the governments with the COVID thing but I, i'm talking more about in, in well, just to take it back to where we started which is ai and if jobs are going to get automated at, at a very let's say more accelerated clip like is there, I don't know, do, do, does humanity need some sort of mechanism by which, you know, we can... Well, hang on a second. Mm. If I answered, I'm all for U UB, and I also answered, I own Bitcoin, don't you see a bit of a conflict of interest there? You know, universal basic income has a very good chance of, through the ways government would fund it, destroying the economy. Mm. But, like, you know, ignore for a second whether or not it's a good idea. Mm. The fact is the political mechanisms behind how will you provide that and how that will evolve in the future, mm. there's a very good chance of being funded by inflation. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. You know, and, and part of that reason is because, well, once you go set UBI at some level, mm. why won't you go set it higher the next election? Well, what mechanism stops that? You know, how do you stop that before you give into the temptation to then start funding it through inflation? And all hell breaks loose and you destroy your economy. You know, I, I, I think that's actually probably the strongest argument against universal basic income, which is it's hard to go and figure out what the level should be. And, you know, in the, you know, and you will wind up with a process where the next step is to game it further. Do you know who Yanni is? His name is on the colored coins white paper. He's the founder of eToro out of Israel. He's like a really, really um anyway. Did he do a UBI coin? <laughs> he 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 launched something similar to an Ubi on Ethereum. Yeah. And and this was presented at the OECD, which is like the regulators of regulators up in Paris. And it wasn't again, it wasn't something that was like by governments, but it was, you know, on the on a blockchain so i i do sometimes think about like I, i'm totally against what you just talked about it's like this like obviously some any politically led uh ubi initiative is going to come from inflation therefore i'm it's nullified and void but I, I sometimes wonder about is there maybe you know an open source free market based approach towards not putting millions of dollars i'm talking like a dollar maybe two in the hands of everyone just because like there are literally so many people dying in, in planet but what Earth difference now. would that make they could eat. The, the thing is, like, what would that actually accomplish? You, you know, like, if you want to reduce poverty, mm. you need to go find a way to go and. Well, and I just point out. So, I talk about there's two different types of poverty we can really go talk about. Mm. All right. One is, I guess, what you could put is one is absolute poverty, and the other one is relative poverty. Okay, I'm following kind of. You know, absolute poverty is when you are dying because you are starving to death. Mm -hmm. Relative poverty is 
my neighbors. You are feel children. like you're worse off than others. Right, right. Okay, okay. But let's talk about yeah. absolute poverty, which is like yeah. the billion people living on literally less than X dollars a day or whatever it is. And that number has been going down quite dramatically. We have made enormous progress mm. in getting rid of absolute poverty. You know, and where is that come huge from? Huge numbers come, of people. Is it come from charity? Is it come from guys like Bill Gates or like from governments? And do, have you it looked comes from that? technology, and particularly, you know, particularly people's ability to then, in you know, essentially indigenously, um, you know, to. I think I think this term uh, gets used in uh, economic development, but sort of indigenously create their own wealth. You know, like handouts do not go create that sort of durable wealth, mm. and the type and the level of wealth necessary to go from. You know, most of your kids haven't survived at adulthood, to well, most of them have. You know. Like that's, that's not a big level of wealth. That's durable things like, you know, getting a little better at farming, for instance, you know, getting a little bit more technology, you know, get, being able to, for instance, say, um, change the social environments a little. I mean, you know, so government is a form of technology in a sense. And mm. often in impoverished areas, what it took was to figure out, well, how do you go and get the local governments go work just, just that much better that people can actually have businesses that function, you know? I mean, as much as people uh, kind of like to hate on it, chances are the U.S.'s uh, habit of sending troops everywhere around the world has raised a ton of people out of poverty for the simple fact that when they aren't screwing things up, they're at least preventing warlords from fighting each other. You know, I'm not talking about like here, Iraqs and Afghanistans. There are troops in tons of countries, and there's probably been a, enough incremental develop, you know, incremental economic development made possible just by reducing levels of violence a little you know like that's the kind of thing that that you need and unfortunately lockdown has been an enormous setback there because it's you know a lot of like how less well-off people contribute back to the economy as a whole winds up being things that you know ultimately drive from tourism and by reducing travel and you could kind of say interactions with other countries, you know, you're not spreading around that wealth in a way and you're giving people less opportunity to go do things. And I could also make the same arguments for, you know, sort of Western countries where it's relative poverty that we're talking about. But, you know, both are true. Like lockdown has changed the economy to be something more related to sort of high tech, high infrastructure companies. It's put so many small businesses out of business. It's so sad. Often because they've literally been shut down by the government. Like, it's just such a step back. But the fact that, like, oh, it's, it's, it's so sad. It's so concerning. I mean, you heard about this barbecue guy in Toronto. Like, I don't yep. even know what is. Yep. It was just super, super just, hard. Just one of, I mean, one of literally thousands of people like him. He just happened to be the one who uh, That's on the news was, stuff. yeah, well, you know, was willing to go and uh, make a public protest out of it. And a bunch have followed. But uh, so, so another thing I wanted to point out, though, was how, so I, I said relative poverty and absolute poverty. But the thing you got to remember is that relative poverty is real. You know, mental health is a big deal. And if people don't feel like they're contributing back to society, you get very bad outcomes. Of course, of course. And who's you know, doing and, the math on that? Like they've done the math on the death rate and whatever, yeah. whatever. But who's doing the math on the fact that yeah. you're just forcing everyone to lose all their do nothing? And you know, it is it is not enough to go give people money. You need to give people meaning. You know, and yeah. unfortunately, like tech has been very good at getting rid of meaning for people by mm -hmm. automating away jobs, and it's you know, and like. Where it becomes a problem is where the tech gets to the point where a big chunk of humanity does not have the intellectual ability to participate in the economy. You know, that was definitely not true when we, for instance, you know, started you know, putting electric motors in farms, right? The sort of work people were doing, you know, you can see it in the jobs people took up, up afterwards. It obviously was less, into, you know, less intellectually challenging than they were capable of because you saw tons of people go from very menial jobs to getting a bit of education and being able to participate in this new economy. But hmm. the fact is most of the world will never be able to go and be a programmer. 
you know, to the level required to be on par with others. And part of that reason being programming is just so efficient at achieving what it does. Like wh where, where would the jobs even come from? You know, like it, it, it's, you know, it's sort of these types of things just fundamentally need less work for the same number of people. But at the same yeah. time, UBI is probably unstable. I mean, I honestly don't have a good answer to any of this. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. Hey, well, I, I mean, I don't think anyone really does, right? It's just, I, I find them interesting and, and uh, uh, I don't know, man. I, I, when I look at like, I got nothing against like older people, but like, I think someone said that Biden's going to be like 96 or something by the time, yeah. you know, it's like, I, I just feel like people our age need to stand up a bit and start critically thinking through things. And, and the way, one of the ways I think is out loud and with people and talking. And so I, I bring up these topics because I don't know, they, I think even 10 years ago, if I would even have mentioned like things like Ubi or AI, people would have like been but like, what the fuck? Here's the problem. <laughs> but people kind of talk about it. Yeah, Young yeah. people are not, uh, are not a single group. The incentives between different groups of young people are radically different. You know, I, mean, I, I went to art school. I mean, I got to see firsthand how there is a big chunk of humanity who does not have the ability to participate at a reasonable level in a high tech economy. You know, they, they don't understand reason. And the crazy thing about that, too, is, you know, that's not a universal across art students at all. There's tons of art students who, you know, came into arts with engineering degrees, mm -hmm. you know, prior careers in that. But there is a distinct subset of people who you just realize the way they think is not compatible with so many of these new jobs. You know, and they may be very good at what they do, probably better than us, but you know, it's a different skill set. And unfortunately, you know, tech doesn't like the economy doesn't create jobs with skill sets that precisely match what people have. You know, that's just an ugly reality. And it, it, you know, probably never will. Oh man, some uh, some interesting uh, you know tangential conversations here, but uh, yeah. highly relevant. Hey Peter, man, I, you know I know you're you're a busy guy. I've taken up two hours of your day. Um, <laughs> where can people if people want to keep? And by the way, if you're if you want to do this again anytime next week, next yeah. week, uh, whenever I'm down. Um, but where do people you know uh, learn more about you? I know you have your own site and you're active on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, that's, well, uh, that's so PeterTodd.com. That's it, right? PeterTodd.org. PeterTodd. Yeah. Okay. Dot org. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And uh, presumably in the future conferences. <laughs> right. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> soon. 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 Hopefully sooner than later. Right, it'll Peter. it'll happen. Yeah. Thanks, right. man. Really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, yeah, we'll bring this one to a close. Yeah. All right.